Hey there, deep diver. Get ready for a deep dive into a world where time gets a little fuzzy. Oh yeah, we're going to be talking about photons, atoms, and a mind-bending phenomenon called negative time. Negative time. Like going back to the future, where's my DeLorean? <laughs> Not quite. Before you start building a time machine, let's be clear. Okay, okay. This isn't time travel as we typically imagine it. So no Marty McFly then? No, unfortunately not this time. It's more about how we understand a photon's journey when it interacts with atoms. It challenges our everyday understanding of cause and effect. Okay, you've officially piqued my curiosity. It's a fascinating topic, and luckily for us, we have some incredible research from a team at the University of Toronto to help us break it down. They're always up to some cool stuff over there. They really are. We'll be diving deep into their paper, experimental evidence that a photon can spend a negative amount of time in an atom cloud. A negative amount of time. My brain already hurts. I know it's a lot to take in, Ugh. but trust me, it's truly fascinating stuff. All right, let's set the scene. Imagine a pulse of light, basically a bunch of photons traveling along until they hit a cloud of rubidium atoms. Okay, I'm imagining it. Now we know that light slows down when it passes through different mediums like water or in this case, a cloud of atoms. But what's actually happening to those photons at the atomic level? Well, at that level, things get really interesting. Each photon in that pulse can interact with the atoms in the cloud. Okay. Think of it like a game of tag. A game of tag. Yeah, the photon is it. And when it interacts with an atom, it briefly excites that atom to a higher energy state. So it's like the photon is giving the atom a high five and then running away. That's a great way to put it. And this interaction causes a delay in the photon's journey. We call this group delay. Group delay, got it. It's essentially how much longer it takes for that pulse of light to pass through the cloud compared to if it traveled through a vacuum. Okay, that makes sense. But what happens when we crank things up a notch? What if the light's frequency gets really close to the atom's resonant frequency? Well, remember that game of tag? Imagine the photon suddenly becomes incredibly good at tagging the atoms. Like a super fast tagger. Exactly. It's like it's almost too good to the point where it seems to tag an atom before it even arrives. Wait, hold on. It tags the atom before it arrives. How is that even possible? That's the mind-blowing part. And that's what the researchers at the University of Toronto set out to explore. So are we saying time travel is real? Should I invest in a hot tub and start working on a sports almanac? Ha <laughs> ha, not quite. What's important to understand is that it's not that time is flowing backward in the literal sense. Okay, so not back to the future time travel. Right. It's more like the photon is borrowing energy from the system, allowing it to seemingly interact with an atom before it would be possible under our classical understanding of time. Okay, I think I'm starting to wrap my head around this. How on earth do you even measure something as fleeting and bizarre as negative time? We're talking about things happening on an atomic level for fractions of a second. That's where the real ingenuity of this experiment comes in. Play it on me. The researchers used a really clever setup with two lasers. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. So one laser acted as our signal. That's the pulse of light we're interested in. The other laser was a constant beam that acted as a probe. And here's where it gets really interesting. The probe beam changes phase depending on the energy state of the atoms in the cloud. So by carefully measuring how that probe beam changes as the signal pulse goes through, they could essentially spy on what those photons were up to inside the atom cloud. You got it. Clever. But I'm guessing it wasn't quite as simple as just watching the lasers, right? You're right. It's a bit more nuanced than that. To isolate the effects of the signal photon, the researchers used a technique called post-selection. Post-selection. It sounds so official. It sounds complicated, but it's not that bad. Imagine you're flipping a coin a thousand times, but you're only interested in seeing what happens right after you flip heads. So you just ignore all the times it lands on tails. Post-selection in this experiment is similar. The researchers basically filtered their results to only look at the cases where the signal photon made it through the cloud. Got it. This allowed them to zero in on the effects of those specific photons interacting with the atoms. So they've got their lasers, their atom cloud, and they're using this post-selection technique to hone in on specific photons. Yes. What did they find? Did they actually measure this negative excitation time? Well, the results were fascinating. They actually found that, well, the results were fascinating. They actually found that depending on the pulse duration and the density of that atom cloud, the excitation time could indeed be negative. Whoa, really? So they actually measured it. Tell me everything. What were they looking at? How do you measure negative time with lasers? 
Okay, so remember how we were talking about the probe beam changing phase, depending on the state of the atom? Yeah, it was like their key to the whole investigation. Exactly. So they measured the phase difference of that probe beam when the signal photon was absorbed by an atom versus when it passed straight through the cloud. By comparing those two scenarios, they could figure out how long the photon actually spent interacting with those atoms. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. But how do you even measure a change that's happening in a fraction of a fraction of a second? We're talking about things going on at the atomic level. It all comes down to the incredible precision of their setup and a very special type of light they used called coherent states. Coherent states? Sounds complicated. It's actually simpler than it sounds. Think of it like a laser pointer. It emits photons in a really organized and predictable way, almost like a perfectly synchronized marching band. Okay. That's coherent light. And because of this organization, researchers could isolate the effect of a single photon interacting with the atoms, even though there were tons of other photons around. That's incredible. So by carefully analyzing how that probe beam's phase changed and using these coherent states of light, they could actually tease out this negative excitation time. Exactly. It's like they were able to track the tiniest blip in the probe beam signal, a blip that told them just how long a single photon had spent interacting with the atoms. And sometimes that blip indicated a negative time, suggesting that the photon had somehow interacted with an atom before it should have been possible. This is wild. Okay, I think I'm starting to see the bigger picture here. They shone a pulse of light through a cloud of atoms, used a second laser to essentially spy on what was happening and then use some very clever techniques to isolate the effects of individual photons. And the results, negative excitation time. It almost sounds too good to be true. How do we know this wasn't just a fluke? Did they repeat the experiment under different conditions? Well, that's the hallmark of good science, isn't it? Replicating results. And the researchers weren't content with just observing this phenomenon once. They actually confirmed it across a range of different conditions. Like what? What kind of conditions? Well, they experimented with different pulse lengths from super short bursts to longer ones. It's kind of like sending runners through an obstacle course. Okay, I like that analogy. Some runners sprint through as fast as they can while others take a more leisurely pace. Right. And by changing the pulse length, they could see how the duration of the photon's interaction with the atoms affected this negative excitation time. Interesting. Did they change anything else? They also tweaked the density of that atom cloud. Imagine adding more obstacles to our race course. Okay. By changing the cloud's density, they could essentially control how likely a photon was to interact with an atom. So they changed the length of the light pulse and they changed the density of the atom cloud. What happened? Did the results still hold up? They did. They found that no matter how they tweaked the experiment, the results were consistent with their initial findings. So it wasn't just some random thing they were seeing. There was a pattern. Absolutely. Changed the pulse length. The excitation time, whether positive or negative, changed right along with it. Make the atom cloud denser. Same thing. And the way it changed always lined up perfectly with what their theoretical models predicted. Wow. So they weren't just seeing random blips in their data. There was a clear and consistent pattern. It's official. Negative excitation time is a real thing. It really seems that way. The results are incredibly compelling. This is mind-blowing stuff. But you know, I have to ask, why should I care? What's the big deal about photons potentially borrowing energy from the future? It's not like I'm going to be sending messages back in time anytime soon, right? Haha, <laughs> probably not. But this research isn't just about rewriting the rules of time travel. It's about pushing the boundaries of our understanding of how the universe works at the most fundamental level. So it's not about time travel, but about deeper principles. I'm listening. This research opens up so many exciting new avenues for exploring the quantum world and its potential applications. Okay. Think of it this way. Every time we deepen our understanding of fundamental physics, we stumble upon new possibilities that we could have never imagined before. So it's not about time travel, but about deeper principles and new possibilities. I'm always up for those. Yeah. What kind of possibilities are we talking about here? What could this negative excitation time actually lead to? Well, you've got to start with the foundation. This research gives us a more complete picture of how light and matter interact at the most fundamental level. It's like we've been reading this book about the universe and suddenly we've discovered a hidden chapter that changes everything. A hidden chapter. I love that analogy. But how does understanding this hidden chapter translate into actual applications? What can we do with this knowledge? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, one really exciting area is quantum computing. 
Okay. One of the biggest challenges in building powerful quantum computers is figuring out how to control and manipulate these incredibly delicate quantum states. Yeah, they're like trying to juggle butterflies. Exactly. And our negative time photons could really come in handy here. Really? How so? Well, think back to that incredibly precise control the researchers had over those photons. That level of control, coupled with this deeper understanding of how light and matter interact, thanks to this negative excitation time phenomenon, could give us entirely new tools to build more stable and more controllable quantum computers. So faster, more powerful quantum computers, thanks to these time-bending photons. I am here for it. What else? How about lightning fast optical communication? Imagine sending information literally at the speed of light, but with even less delay because you're exploiting these quantum quirks. Whoa, that would be incredible. Right. This research could pave the way for communication technologies that would make our current internet seem like the Pony Express. Okay, that's just wild. Faster computers, faster communications. Hmm. What else could this lead to? This almost sounds too good to be true. Well, it's still early days, but that's the beauty of fundamental research. You never know where it might lead. This discovery could even change how we store information one day. Okay, now you're blowing my mind. Right now, we mostly rely on ones and zeros etched onto physical media like hard drives or the cloud. But imagine storing information in the quantum states of atoms themselves. The amount of data we could store would be astronomical. Mind officially blown. This has been an incredible journey into the quantum world. Listeners, next time you see a beam of light, remember, there might just be some negative time shenanigans going on at the atomic level. It's a pretty amazing thought, isn't it? It really is. And on that note, we'll leave you to ponder the mysteries of the quantum world. Until next time, keep those brains buzzing and those questions coming.